Cool. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Kanta Hagleitner. This is uh, Gopal. Vijay Raghavan. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I work at Hortonworks. I'm a uh, test PMC member and I'm a Hive PMC member. Uh, on Hortonworks, I focus on uh, Hive, uh, especially the performance aspects. And uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I work on all the perf stuff from Yarn, HDFS, Days, Hive. Uh, from, turns out we have a lot of slides for today, so I'm going to try to not rush through uh, them too much, but I might have to skip a few. If I do, that will be homework for everyone. Uh, I expect those to be read right afterwards. Um, so before I jump into Hive and Test and the performance uh, aspect in more detail, uh, I just wanted to set the context real quick on uh, uh, how this work happened and uh, what the, the, the context for this work was. Uh, at Hortonworks, uh, and you might have heard that today, uh, we, about a year, more than a year ago, we started the uh, Stinger project. Um, Stinger project, it's not a uh, product, it's not an Apache product, it's, uh, it's just an initiative that we started in the community um, to uh, speed up Hive uh, and make Hive accessible in, in human time and as well as uh, make it accessible to tools uh, without compromising uh, the things that it already does well, which is uh, working at large scale and providing a fairly rich uh, <laughs> feature set. Uh, SQL feature set. Um, so when I was here last year, I talked about uh, uh, Hive uh, and, and the Stinger project. We had uh, we were just about to release Hive 11. Uh, in the meantime, we've done Hive 12 and Hive 13. A lot of the things I talked about then uh, have come to fruition, and I'm uh, I'm back to talk about them, and uh, I'll give you a little bit more detail on how they work. Um, before uh, we dive into uh, the performance, which is uh, what you're hopefully all here for, uh, just a shout out to the guys that are continue to expand the SQL functionality in Hive. Obviously very important uh, for folks that are building uh, applications uh, using uh, Hive, as well as uh, folks that use tools or, or try to get SQL tools to work with Hive. We continue to expand what's available on uh, the SQL front. Uh, Hive 13 has a lot of new stuff, common table expressions, subqueries in where con having clause, um, expanded joint syntax, which is the old school joint syntax, the comma separated joints, etc. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, we now have a pretty complete set of uh, data types that uh, other databases support and that tools expect. Just wanted to uh, say that it's not all about performance. We, we do uh, spend a lot of time on making sure that uh, the SQL support is adequate and that you have uh, the the ability to integrate with, uh, with tools. Um, performance is what it is all about, though, uh, in this talk. Um, we're going to go basically top down in the query execution. We're going to talk about planning. We're going to talk about uh, uh, logical plans, physical plans. We're going to talk about IO paths and uh, uh, actual execution on the cluster, how the JVM, uh, how, we, we, how we get the most performance out of the JVM, et cetera. So that's basically uh, how we're going to go through this. Um, so let's start at the top. The first thing I want to talk about is uh, statistics. Uh, Hive has had uh, statistics for quite a while now, uh, and we're now starting to really leverage this heavily, uh, and a lot of the things that we're doing now is based on, on this. So Hive has different levels of statistics. It has a full column level statistics. If you choose to compute them, uh, it can capture some basic statistics uh, automatically as you ingest data into Hive. Uh, and it can even uh, try to do some estimates and uh, some planning um, uh, if you don't have any um, statistics and you're just working off uh, raw file sizes uh, and schema and that kind of stuff. Uh, in TES, we're using this heavily. Uh, we needed to um, find out what the right parallelism is. Uh, we've, uh, we use it to uh, <coughs> make the, uh, the right uh, selection in terms of uh, join algorithms, for instance. All of that stuff relies on statistics. Uh, what is new in Hive now, uh, and uh, which might make it into Hive 13, uh, I'm not quite sure it will be in, uh, in HTTP uh, 2.1 in, in Hive uh, that Hortonworks is about to release, uh, is uh, a primary uh, the, the first step integration of a uh, cost-based optimizer in Hive. Um, the goals for, for Hive for cost-based optimizer is as people start writing larger and larger queries, uh, as they start uh, nesting uh, views and using common table expressions, uh, you, your plans become quite complex, and, uh, and, and TES, as a new execution framework, so allows a lot more flexibility in how we can actually process the query. Uh, as that expands, um, a cost-based optimizer is a critical piece to, to be able to 
uh, plan your query to the, to the fullest extent and do that in a, in a, a consistent fashion. So um, we're excited to see that uh, in its current form, um, it uh, has focused mostly on uh, join, or, um, join reordering, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit next uh, by example. So the initial version of the Hive cost base optimizer primarily focused on uh, join reordering. If you have queries like this, this is uh, uh, TPC DS query 17. You can see a quite complex query with a lot of tables in the join. Um, it basically has three fact tables, uh, the store return, store sales, and uh, catalog sales, uh, which are joined independently by the date dimension, and then the store sales also by item and store. Um, so quite a complex uh, join tree. Uh, if you look at the tree as written, uh, you basically end up doing a full uh, join between the three uh, fact tables, which is uh, catalog sales, store sales, and uh, uh, store returns. That is quite large. Uh, it has the biggest cardinality in this whole um, uh, join tree. And uh, it's obviously not the right way to actually um, order the join to, to for, 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 for speed. So um, the CBO will look at this. Uh, uh, on the top, you see the non-CBO plan, which is doing this uh, three-way uh, fact table join first. Uh, the CBO plan will actually pick a uh, date dimension first and filter down the store sales. Um, and then order the other tables a little bit in this massive joint to uh, filter as soon as possible, uh, which is definitely going to help to get to time them. So we ran this uh, against, I think, a 10K data set. Uh, we restricted the facts to three months. But you can see, uh, even in its current form, and there's still some limitations, uh, we're still working on details of the cost uh, uh, formula, and uh, we're not looking at all joint permutations yet. Uh, so we're still... Uh, uh, working and stuff like that, but even with uh, uh, with uh, what's, what's there right now, you can see uh, dramatic career improvements, 127 seconds to 44. All right, Tess uh, is up next. Uh, so you probably heard about Tess today already. You might have heard before it, uh, heard about it before. Uh, Tess is a uh, uh, um, framework for applications to distribute data processing. It uh, kind of replaces uh, MapReduce for us on. on on Hive, uh, Pig, other um, other um, tools to do uh, to write programs in as its uh, core underlying uh, execution framework. Test promises to do have uh, smaller latency, and we've seen, and Gopal will go into much detail about this. Uh, but uh, it also gives us uh, higher throughput for batch queries, so it's not limited to a small data set or anything like that. It will scale nicely from from smaller data sets to larger data sets. The basic uh, idea is that, from an application um, perspective, is that you specify a logical graph uh, of processing nodes and how the data has to flow between these processing nodes to uh, compute uh, the result that you're after. And that's what Hive is now using to, uh, to uh, process its plans. So I'm going to go through some examples on how we're using TES and what it enables, and I think uh, you get a better feeling of, uh, of, of, of really what's the difference there. Um, so this is kind of uh, the overview. I don't want to go um, into every little aspect of this query, but I think the big takeaway is uh, in Hive, we always had to process uh, large and complex queries. Uh, we usually did that by chunking them down in a lot of MapReduce uh, map jobs. So if you look at the left side, there is one MapReduce job on, uh, on the top left to uh, do one uh, aggregation. There's another MapReduce job next to it on, uh, to do an aggregation. The, the results are always materialized in HDFS, and then the join will read these materialized uh, result sets, do a join, write it back onto HDFS, and then read it back in and do the order by. In TES, we can just submit the full graph. We have much more flexibility in how we ship the data around. We can eliminate a lot of the uh, rescheduling overhead of the writing, materializing overhead, and uh, we can stream data between nodes, and we can build hash tables in memory and cache stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that uh, Test gives us a lot more fine-grained control over where data is processed and how data is processed and moved uh, in the cluster. So pretty exciting. Uh, one simple example is uh, the shuffle join. Uh, shuffle join is the, is, the, is the classic join in uh, MapReduce. Uh, the difference doesn't look very big. I mean, on the left side, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the nodes uh, and the connections actually are exactly the same. The big difference is that on MapReduce, this, uh, the left side would be a single map task that will process two operator pipelines for each one of the tables. Uh, in, uh, in, in TES, we can split those out and just create two vertices 
uh, to handle each one of them. Uh, that doesn't look like a big difference, but it uh, does things like we don't have to tag uh, the data anymore on each row. We don't have to tell, we don't have to bake into every row which side uh, or from which table it is from. And the mappers don't have to know both the operator pipelines, so they don't have to switch back and forth when they process stuff. That uh, helps us if you, if you have a lot of stuff cached in your uh, processor, because if you switch operator pipeline, you have to clear out that uh, cache and start afresh. So it doesn't look very different, but it uh, makes a big difference. Uh, broadcast join uh, is basically, if you've been using Hive, uh, there is something called map join that you might be familiar with. It basically means uh, you have a join where one side of the join, the relation is fairly small, you can hold it in memory, and you can use a hash table uh, to uh, join the two sides. Uh, on MapReduce, that worked by processing the smaller table on the client, uh, producing a hash table, and then shipping it through the cluster via uh, distributed cache. On test, this is much more flexible. We actually start nodes, processing nodes in the cluster, and we'll start processing the smaller side as well. And then stream the tables to the nodes that do the join, build up the hash table, and keep going from there. Um, I have some uh, graphs that show how this is uh, more flexible. It's on the left side, what I just described, uh, uh, build the hash table locally on the client node and then ship it into the processing. On the right side, you can process the smaller side. Uh, in a uh, vertex itself, it can be done in parallel and it will be streamed directly to the joint processing. <laughs> Another example shows uh, that this is uh, possible now at any level in the, in, the, in the processing. So the query, for instance, does an aggregate in a subquery which has a pretty small data set that needs to be joined uh, with a larger data set. Uh, in MapReduce, this would have uh, resulted in writing the, the small um, side of the table out on HDFS and then uh, doing a shuffle join on the resulting uh, data set. In TES, first of all, we have the statistics and we use the statistics to choose the join algorithms up front. And we can directly from this, these reduced nodes that produce the aggregate, stream the data to the join processing nodes and continue on processing. That makes a tremendous uh, difference in uh, processing times. Um, when you do that, when you have a hash join, uh, you need to be able to fit your data set into memory in order to do it efficiently. Uh, if you have a number of joins that you're trying to do at the same time, you might be able to fit some tables into memory, but not all of them. Uh, in TES, what we can do, uh, which is a new concept, a new uh, connection between processing nodes, is a one-to-one -one edge which basically says, okay, you're processing uh, the data currently in 10 nodes, do that first join there, and then as you're done with it, stream the records directly to the next processing node where we do another uh, join uh, to complete the result set. So it's pretty nifty. Uh, dynamically partitioned hash join, um, that is uh, another concept that, uh, that uh, TES enables us to do. It has been, there is a form of this in MapReduce in, in Hive today, um, it's called the bucketed map join, you might have used it. Uh, bucketed map join works if two tables are bucketed uh, the same way. Uh, it basically, uh, MapReduce will do a join, a map join for each bucket on both sides. Uh, in test, this is again more flexible. It lets us do this uh, in, a, in, a, in a niftier way. Um, you just need one uh, part, the large table. If that one is uh, partitioned a certain way, we can do the join by dynamically partition the other side and stream only the fragments that you need um, to the tasks uh, on, uh, that are processing the, the, the large table. Um, so the graph looks very similar. On the left side, it's the exact same uh, graph as you've just seen in the, in the map join. Uh, the only difference is that it's being done once per bucket uh, of your table. On the right side, the interesting thing to note is that uh, uh, we're using a custom edge which lets us finally control how the data is moved to which uh, uh, task of the downstream vertex so that the, the right uh, parts of the table meet each other in, in, in the join. Uh, I think we talked about uh, all of these. So um, one other thing that I, that I want to mention for the dynamic partition join is that you can do that also um, further down in a subquery or in a, in a larger processing chain. Uh, if you have, you know, your number 15 uh, vertex in your, in your graph, if that uh, is running a group by and you've already partitioned this data set for a group by, um, Hive on test will automatically leverage that uh, uh, partitioning that you've just done and make sure that the, the right side of the join matches the left side and only the data that is needed is being uh, transferred. 
All right, another example, UnionAll. Uh, UnionAll is a pretty simple operation. I mean, you have two uh, uh, queries, uh, and the result set is simply the, 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 uh, all the rows from the first side plus all the rows from the second side. Um, in MapReduce, it turned out that uh, there was, um, that we, we had to do some fairly inefficient things at some uh, times to make this happen. The reason was that uh, the framework lets you write uh, one directory at a time, and we needed to have a way to kind of mix the two data sets and write it into a single directory. Uh, in Tail, there is a construct uh, called uh, grouped vertices, um, which is basically, you have a bunch of uh, ver uh, vertex uh, uh, vertices that, uh, that do processing, and you can add them to a group. And then whatever, when, when data from any of these vertexes is written, or if you connect that uh, grouped vertex to a downstream vertex, it will automatically do the union for you and, and, and shift uh, and move the, the entire uh, unionized uh, data set around. So again, uh, on the left side in MapReduce, what we do is we uh, compute to do subqueries, do the aggregates, uh, write it to HDFS, and then basically I uh, have a, a dummy operator that does nothing but uh, read these two sides, uh, shuffle it to the same uh, downstream vertex, and then uh, finish the processing. In test, we don't need that. We can just, um, through that uh, vertex group, uh, uh, move the data downstream. <clears throat> okay, that's the final example I'm going to give on uh, how uh, test is awesome and makes our life easier. Uh, this is multi-insert queries. That's a feature that Hive has that uh, is aimed largely at uh, ETL kind of queries. Um, it basically works in a way that you say, um, you specify a data set and then you write different ways of how uh, different tables have to be populated. Let me give you an example actually real quick. So if you look at that query, it starts with the from clause. It's not very SQL, but uh, it works in Hive. Uh, you, you start with the from clause, you say this is uh, basically the data set that, I, that is common to, uh, to the tables that I'm going to populate, and then you say how the different tables are different and which part goes into which file. Um, yes, so this in Hive uh, on MR usually meant uh, we compute the common table set, the table sort that is specif specified in the from clause, but then we have to materialize it and start multiple MapReduce jobs to actually writes the final result uh, into the table locations that they need to go. Uh, on test again, uh, much simpler, we can again produce the result of the uh, from clause, uh, prepare the table, the table source that is necessary there. But then we can, in this case for instance, uh, directly stream to multiple downstream vertices uh, and continue the processing there without uh, interrupting or writing to HDFS or starting multiple jobs. Uh, and do the final, in this case, uh, distinct there and, uh, and, and write it to the, to, the, to the final target table. All right, so I hope I convinced you that uh, TES is more flexible, more powerful, and that there's a lot of inefficiencies that we were able to remove, and uh, that uh, uh, really helped us in, 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 in Hive to uh, get um, better query plans on the way. Uh, TES uh, can be, um, the queries can become very large again, like uh, if you use uh, views, common table expressions, that kind of stuff. Um, that can be many, many nodes. We've seen queries that have 80 vertices. Each vertex can then translate into 1,000 tasks that are being run in the cluster. Uh, TES handles all this well, and we can really compute these queries uh, in an efficient way uh, from beginning to end. So very excited about that. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Gopal, who's going to tell you how these plans are actually being executed on the cluster. OK. Uh, so. What Gunther talked about mostly was how to generate a physical plan and a logical plan. But uh, some of the, uh, the, the last 2x or 3x performance difference comes from the bottom of the pipeline, where we actually control how everything is executed. Right? So um, you can't actually do more than you have actually CPU or disk or memory for. Right? Like you have like some options on optimizing the, uh, the execution of things. One is to actually not do things or say that you can decide whether to do them if something, something else fails. Right? You defer that decision. Hopefully, you don't hit it. But, and the other way is actually to cache some results so that you don't actually run anything irrelevant again. Or you actually run everything in parallel as much as possible. But usually, the same task as parallel as possible. And when you actually have to do one thing, 
you actually try to do it in bulk so that you actually get all the efficiencies of caching, right? And finally, because we are running very, very complex graphs here, we end up with a lot of cases where all the inputs of one vertex is ready, and we can actually start processing it without waiting for any of the other vertexes. Now, uh, last year I was here presenting about a particular benchmark I was running with a certain query plan we had optimized. And in the last 12 months or so, what we have actually done is we have made the execution of that plan so much better, right? Uh, compare this to what we do in Hive today. I mean, I should say, compare this to how we do things in MR today, is that we end up doing a lot of things that we don't need to do in the beginning. We have nothing actually saved in the cluster for us to reuse. And several parts of concurrency, like what Gunther said, the local task or whatever is run on the client, the concurrency of all those things are very limited. So uh, before I go into Tay's proper, let me talk about uh, the, the improvements that we made in Hive internals. So uh, one of the recent things that we've done, thanks to Orc, is to have a vectorized reader. Now a vectorized reader actually is basically optimizing the bottom end of the read, right? And the vectorized reader brings us two main advantages. It takes us away from reading one row, pumping it all the way through the pipeline before being able to read the next row in, right? It, it gives us a huge advantage here because for one, for a large amount of org data, a lot of the rows uh, or a lot of the columns in the row can be the same. So what vectorization gives us is a, a cache improvement in the way we operate on the uh, CPU pipeline as well as a way of avoiding computation on the same column that is identical multiple times. Uh, to give you an example, the date field in most partition data will be exactly the same for significant number of rows, right? So if you have a comparison on the date field, you actually have to compare it once and say that for these 1024 rows, this comparison is done. Similarly, we, uh, in the older Hive pipeline, we actually used to not know what type two operands were, right? Every time you did an equality, you had to actually check whether do, these two things can be compared, and if they can be compared, how exactly to compare them. So we throw all those decisions out into the beginning of the plan, and run your plan through a vectorizer, which actually figures out that this is going to be an integer, this is going to be an integer forever, and this, the right side I'm comparing to is a constant, right? That information never used to exist. And we get a huge time saving about not doing this millions and millions and millions of times on the cluster. Right? So vectorization gave us a boost on how we use CPU. It gave us a boost in the throughput of our queries. It saved a lot of memory because you didn't actually have to read an item, pass it through several pipelines, and then read another item, pass it through several pipelines. We ended up reusing the same space. For example, if you're reading integers, you had an integer array that you populated, took it to the end of the pipeline, repopulate the same integer array. And this is an artifact of Java that an integer object is very, very differently sized from an integer in int, right? And it's like a 4x, 5x difference. So we ended up saving that much memory just by doing every operation in bulk. The next bit that we did in the vectorization pipeline was to avoid a blocking read call. So earlier I actually talked about pipelines. What used to happen with HDFS interactions before in ORC was that you would actually fire a read call for how much ever data you wanted. And then when that read call completed, you would start deserializing it. Now with the zero copy read, what has become really good is that you can actually fire a memory map read and start deserializing it and the operating system will actually take care of reading it as you pass through it, right? For a significant number of cases, you might never deserialize a particular column at all. Because if you filter a column and you find out that the rest of the columns are not worthwhile to look at right now, you just skip reading all of them, right? So we end up avoiding having to read multiple columns from disk only to never deserialize it, and you avoid a blocking read call which you have to wait for completion before you actually start using the CPU. Now, these two things were wins for Hive. But Tay has actually 
got us way more than these two things. Right? So, let's pick up a query that is in motion. And I've put some extra logging in there so that we have a timeline of where things are. Right? Where things happen. And trying to figure out whether we can actually see all these things in action. Right? So, this is a query that takes about 200 tasks uh, uh, in a cluster with 20 nodes. And, well, it takes 221 or something like that. But the 21 ones aren't relevant at this point. But So, we map out all of them in a timeline where the horizontal axis is actually which container is it running on. The green line is when it actually started talking to yarn. The bold section is when the task is running. And the bold section is labeled color coded according to what vertex it is running. Right? So, what do we not do in this? So, one of the things that we do not do in Hive this is that we don't actually bother uploading HiveXec for every query. One of the things with MapReduce was that you had to actually submit a job jar with every, every MapReduce task you did. Right? You ended up sending the same jar over and over again into the cluster. What we have done with Hive this is to actually say that here is this Hive exec.jar that is sitting in HDFS. Use this for all queries we run. Right? And that makes a big difference because Yarn has something called distributor cache. Once it enters a distributor cache, if I run a, a Hive query, it gets cached on those nodes for everybody. Right? So the moment you have a fixed install location, this part of your latency is gone. The next part is that when do you spin up an AM? And AM for this context is Application Master, which is a YARN concept, which tracks what are you running. So uh, in a multi-stage query like we had in uh, MR land with Hive, you had to spin up an AM for every single stage of your query. If you had a map reduce task and it completed, the AM actually exited, and you had to spin up a new AM to actually keep going the next step. We entirely skip this step by saying that the same AM stays alive throughout the period of this query. Right? And lastly, we just completely remove the Hive client local task and threw it on the server. And this might not seem like a big deal, but for most people who are using Hive client from one server where everybody is allowed to log in, you are essentially limited by that one machine for how many tasks you could run. If you picked a benchmark where one person was running a query, this probably wouldn't show up. But in a production environment, where there is a blessed box for running Hive, this actually makes a big difference. Next, we took all the small tasks we used to run in the client, one after the other, and we started running all of them in parallel. So uh, in, the, in the graph that you're seeing, the dark blue map one, map two, and the small small map tasks, except, all, everything except map2, are actually small tasks which are running in parallel. And there's, a, there's an advantage to running them in parallel more than the fact that they're all being computed at the same time. They're being computed on the cluster, which basically means that after you have finished computation, there is no actual step to move it into the cluster. right? And hopefully, that the ta local task you're running that reads data from HDFS get some locality of reference, that it will actually run on the same node the data is on. right? If you're taking a 40 MB table and getting 4 KB out of it, in this case, hopefully, you'll never move the 40 MB through a network port. And that's a win. And in this case, the TAS broadcast join, the way it is designed, helps us a lot. Because that, can, that basically takes the local task and effectively makes it part of the whole task. Next, next thing that we actually do very slowly is split generation. Like trying to figure out how many splits to generate, how to actually split your data up into small enough chunks so that MapReduce can run it, used to happen on the client. Again, this is not a significant problem for anybody who runs it, runs one query at a time. But when people fire many, many requests at something like Hive Server 2, the machine that runs the Hive Server actually has to do all these operations in parallel on the client. Now, being able to actually move it into the cluster gives us many, many advantages. One is that it will get randomly picked for a rack somewhere in the cluster, assuming you have a large cluster. 
so that no part of the cluster will be heavily loaded. Like you will not have a bottleneck on where it is picked. The second thing is that you can actually run more threads when you're running in the cluster, more than you could actually run it on the client. Again, that's again to cater to people who run many, many queries. But the fact that we generate all splits in parallel basically converts the problem that we had of sequentially calculating split, calculating hash table, uploading hash table into a completely parallel activity. You calculate your splits, and you calculate splits for every table in parallel in the application master. The, the other advantage of having this extra CPU that you gain by running it somewhere is that you can do more than just calculate splits. So ORC has a, a feature called predicate pushdown, which basically lets us take a where clause and put it into your input format, right? To say that I only want data from December, right, of every year. Now, you might actually never have partitioned this data by month. You might just have partitioned by year. But OR can actually figure out, look at a file and see that this has the range 1 to 2 for the month field. You don't have to bother reading this file. Right? So you could actually go through an entire query and take your where clause and find something called a searchable argument, which is a SARG, and run it on your split in the last 4 KB of the file and decide whether to process this file or not. So you could, like, I have a 10 TB query that runs in a few seconds because the system very quickly finds out that there is no data that I'm looking for. Right? Be and this is more significant when you're inserting data because you've just ins like taken a large dump of data, inserted into Hive for the first time, and you're trying to figure out if you did the right thing. Right? You're trying to figure out if did you insert something with a negative one price. And you know that probably the likelihood is very little but you still want to run a query to make sure. This massively speeds up data verification queries where you're not likely to find what you're looking for. And significant amount of tooling that business intelligence systems use always look for anti-patterns like this, where the pattern is like one or two percentage of the entire data set. And this lets us narrow our search field massively before we actually load the cluster. So, we calculate the splits, we eliminate the splits, and we do not wait for any other table to be ready. If all input for this vertex is ready, we send it out to the cluster. If you notice the, the green line, vertical line that is actually marked there, you'll see that it is staggered. It is staggered because the split calculation of all of them took various amounts of time, but the moment the date dimension got calculated, which is probably the first line, it actually fired its task immediately, so that the quicker it finishes, quicker everything else can begin, right? You're saving time by hiding latencies of various tasks into latencies of other previous tasks, right? And ORC actually gets you a bit more than just predicate pushdown. ORC gives you a little more predictability on how much data is transferred over the network, right? So, for example, RC file, which is a format we used to use before ARC, used to have features to look for where is a split point, right? In ARC, we added two features where, one, you have a footer block which says where do the splits actually start and end, so that you never have a split which doesn't read any data, which, which used to happen with RC file, because if you split a file too small, you'll end up with a split which neither has a start or a finish in it, which means it will not read any data which will be wasted because you'll spin up a task, take up somebody else's time on the cluster because we're trying to be fair to the whole, everybody using the cluster, not just your query. So, ORC gives us actual split points. We can say that at this point, an ORC stripe begins. And more importantly, ORC can actually pad the data while writing so that these split points fall at HTFS boundaries so that you will never have to figure out how much of this data is on this machine. If this HTFS block is on this machine, everything you need to read is on this machine. You never have to actually go to the network to read anything else. And this is a huge advantage. When you actually have a network where you have data moving across racks, you basically don't want to hold up that traffic in any way. 
Next awesome thing that Tez has added is container reuse. So you might have noticed that there are multiple squares in each line. And I said each one of those lines is a container. That's actually spinning up a JVM and keeping it alive to actually run many, many more things in one container. So you actually run more than one vertex in a container. And this basically means that the, the green lines that you're seeing there don't really matter. Because even if it takes three or four seconds for, to, for a container to spin up and the JVM to start up, after a while, all the latencies that you incurred in the beginning have gone away. Because as long as you're talking to Hive server, Hive server is talking to one of the containers, you're good because you're just reusing the same container somebody else spin up. It also has an advantage because you can assume that as long as you're running the same vertex, you can cache the pipeline in the task itself. So if you're running map one on a split, map two on, map one on the, a different split, you don't actually reload everything for map one in the meantime. Right? We actually make sure that as long as you're running the same vertex in a container, we don't throw away a lot of data. And the JVM JIT is actually really, really good at optimizing as you keep running the same thing over and over again. Right? If you're reading ORC data, it just improves your ORC reader as you re keep reading ORC data. And I don't have to do anything. The JIT is smart. And then we have a session, which is a TS uh, application master that has been spun up that can actually service multiple queries. Which basically means that as you keep running queries, as anyone keeps running queries, the system slowly gets faster and faster and faster. Because at some point or the other, you're running x 64 native code, even though you wrote Java, that has been optimized for the kind of queries you run, right? And at some level or the other, hooking this up to Hive server and being able to share sessions for the same user basically means that we don't actually pay a cost for all these features just because you are using it over JDBC, right? So every, every BI tool that you end up using is going to talk to Hive through JDBC. They're, it's not going to open a Hive shell and type stuff into it, right? So it, as long as everybody who's running as the same user is firing queries at the system, the system will keep containers alive for a fixed amount of time. I usually set it to two minutes or so. So that if in two minutes another query comes in, you get all the benefits of all the queries that ran before for the JIT. We don't throw it away immediately. I have tested this to the extreme by running very, very large queries, like 14,000, 15,000 task queries. This is an 8,000 task query, which when you try to map it out, basically gives you a very pretty picture. Like there's very little I can read from it now. But, uh, or you end up running the same query over and over and over again to see if it will go down because these two are very important things for this system to actually function well, is that you can run a large number of queries and that you can run very large queries. Uh, I'm going to skip over that diagram, but basically we also optimized how yarn moves data around in the cluster because when you have a complex DAG, like the one below, you actually move, end up moving a lot of data over yarn shuffle, not just over HDFS. And the advantage the yarn shuffle has is that if you need 200 containers to hold everything in memory, the moment 999 containers are done, you can let them go because Yarn will serve all the data that you have created to the next set of tasks in your pipeline. You do not have to keep data in memory in your tasks at all, which basically means getting four fewer containers than you asked for is no longer going to kill your query, which is not true for any memory-bound system. And finally, we have something that actually measures data on the cluster after running 90% of your tasks. So assume that a statistic, uh, high statistics screws up your reducer estimation. It says you need 999 reducers, and you only need 40, right? Why bother running 999, right? So what the system will do is run 90% of your map tasks, and then try to group them so that each reducer gets the same fixed amount of data. Right? This massively improves something like group by, where you do not know if there is going to be a skew. And this is an added advantage, because when we add speculation, we can say that 1 to 100 buckets went to one reducer. And when we speculate, I can say 10 each went to a reducer. I can, I can speculate 10 times faster than my first task. Right? And this all adds up to 
something that we used to run in 600 seconds in Hadoop 1 with partition data, RC file, to something that runs under 5 seconds. Right? It's a lot of 1.5x, 1.x, all multiplied. It's like compound interest in action. Everything added a little, but when you add it all up, you get a very, very large number. So, bunch of numbers I had to show, but I'm guessing I'm out of time. But uh, scale factor 200, uh, we are running queries almost everything under 10 seconds. Scale factor 1000, we are running almost everything in 25 seconds, 38 seconds. And as the data size goes up, most of the cost optimizations that we have done start to even out for everybody because the amount of CPU and amount of memory you have is the same. You have just saved a lot in the beginning. You have saved a lot in how you use the cluster, but you have not saved a lot in uh, exactly how much data is there or exactly how much data output is there. You can make it efficient, but 100% is sort of like an asymptotic curve. And this is sort of what is all coming up in the next year. I can probably, Gantar can just jump in. Yeah, I think we're out of time. So yeah. I'd rather say, do we have time for any questions or uh, do we have to wrap it up? I think we do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we can take maybe a couple questions if, uh, if there are any. Yeah. Yes. Um, so for many operations, as they're defined in the SQL standard, it's not quite the same as in Java primitives. For example, if you just sum up a field, and yeah. that with Java primitives, they overflow, they just flip around, they go off. We actually have macros written in Hive for each of these types. So it's not actually code generator using Java primitives. We read a long, we read another long, but the output need not be a long. Okay. So there is a whole Hive decimal setup inside which handles decimal numbers, which is far more complex than all the longs and floats that we deal with. Even for that, we generate, but we don't have to check whether it's a decimal added to a long. We already know it from the SQL plan. At runtime, we don't, we don't have checks for that. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> So, uh, as I said, there's multiple levels of uh, statistics in Hive. Uh, the basic statistics you can let Hive gather automatically whenever you insert something. And when you add a new partition, that is being updated automatically. Um, if you want to full column uh, level statistics with NDVs and all that stuff, you have to run an, 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 alter, no, an analyze table command. And you have to, if you add a new partition to the data set, for instance, if you update the data, you have to rerun that uh, to uh, regenerate the data set. Hive will use the ones that are already there, but if it touches the new one and you haven't run an analyze, it will not have the uh, stats for that. Okay, no sorry. Have it, right? <laughs> yeah, so we're way out of time. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, appreciate it.